Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Doug Evans, Chair of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and welcome to our weekly video on updates and innovations in the Department of Surgery. Today, I'm lucky enough to be, to be joined by Dr. Pete Rossi. Welcome, Pete. Pete is Associate Professor of Vascular Surgery and Associate Director of the Heart and Vascular Surgery Service Line here at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Frederick Hospital. Uh, Pete graduated from the University of Illinois College of Medicine, did his surgical training at the University of Chicago, and came here to the Medical College of Wisconsin to complete a fellowship in vascular surgery, where we are lucky enough that he has remained. And uh, Pete has been with us uh, for now uh, a little over 10 years on our faculty. And uh, Pete, before we get to the subject of today's video, which is carotid artery disease, maybe you could explain a little bit about vascular surgery as a subspecialty and the fact that you did a fellowship after what was somewhere between five and seven years of surgery training. Sure. So there are a lot of people, obviously, that deal with vascular disease in the community, and vascular surgeons have particular training in both open surgery and techniques that involve balloons and catheters and what we call minimally invasive endovascular techniques. The difference between vascular surgeons and most other specialists that consider themselves vascular specialists is that we have every tool available to us to take care of vascular disease, whereas most other specialists mm -hmm. only have one specialized procedure that they'll do. So vascular surgeons do usually five years of general surgery training after medical school, followed by two years of fellowship, which is usually very rigorous with a very broad uh, training in all vascular disease, including medical management of vascular disease. And most other people that are uh, out there as vascular specialists don't really do that. Yeah. And so by this, from the standpoint of the scope of vascular surgery, obviously today we're going to talk a little bit about the carotid artery in the neck. Um, but the, other, the air, other areas where you as a vascular surgeon and your partners, because you're a part of a large division here, uh, work, maybe you could go over the parts of the body that, that, you, that encompasses the specialty of vascular surgery. Sure, we pretty much take care of every blood vessel in the body except inside the brain and inside the heart. So when it comes to both arteries and veins, we work in the legs, in, in the arms, in the belly, in the chest. Um, work on veins as well as arteries. And all of these things have different areas where they need to be worked on. There are aneurysms, which are dilations of blood vessels that have to be treated. There are blockages that have to be treated in pretty much any part of the body. It can happen in the blood vessels of the intestines, blood vessels to the kidneys, to the legs, arms, to the neck. Aneurysms can occur in any of those locations within the arteries. And then there's venous disease that occurs in legs and in the chest and various other parts of the body that can require correction as well. And because uh, oftentimes uh, problems with blood flow uh, to, to a leg, to an arm, even blood flow to the brain can occur at inopportune times, you are equally um, skilled at working at night as well as during the day, correct? Some would say that I spend more time working at night yeah. than during the day, but that's kind of how we all do it. So let's get back to carotid artery. The carotid artery is in the neck. Yes, it is. And um, what can go wrong with the carotid artery? So the carotid artery is an artery like any other artery in the body that can form aneurysms, which are dilations, swelling of the blood vessel, which are extremely rare. What's very common is blockage in the carotid artery where it divides in the neck. So the carotid artery comes out of the chest, goes up the neck, and it splits in the neck to go to the face and to the brain. When blockages develop, it tends to be in arteries where they divide, so at branch points in arteries. And the artery in the neck where it branches is an extremely common place to get blockages. And what causes these blockages? Those blockages are usually caused by a combination of four things, which are smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. So really it's atherosclerotic buildup or gradual narrowing over time of that vessel. Is that, is that accurate? That's right. It comes on over many years. And one of the most important things to remember about that for anyone is that when you have blockage of the neck arteries that's developing because of this atherosclerosis condition, it's also happening in all the rest of the arteries of the body. It's not an isolated condition. Mm -hmm. So patients with carotid artery blockages very commonly have blockages in the coronary arteries in their heart that can lead to heart attacks. They often have blockages in the arteries to the legs, so these things all have to be watched for very carefully. Yeah. So how do you treat um, carotid artery disease? It depends on the patient. The vast majority of patients with carotid artery disease are treated with medicine and not with surgery or any other procedure. And the medical treatment for that is the same as treatment for blockages in the heart arteries. So aspirin is extremely important. Other types of medicine to reduce cholesterol are important. Getting rid of cigarettes is extremely important. 
and very good control of uh, blood pressure is also very important. And for diabetics, getting the diabetes under very good control and keeping the blood sugars down helps prevent progression of disease. And how does someone present with carotid artery disease? I mean, how do they, how do they know that this may, may be a problem? A large percentage of people with carotid artery disease are asymptomatic and it's uh, found by their primary care doctor by listening to their neck and hearing a swishing sound, what we call a brewy. And that so when they listen with their stethoscope? Correct. So yeah. in addition to listening to the heart, they then move it up and listen to the neck. And I think many people watching this video may have had that, right. that occur when they were in for a routine health exam. That's very, very common. And the interesting part about that is when the primary care doctor hears a brewery, they hear that swishing sound in the neck, only 30% of those patients actually have a blockage. 70% actually have no blockage, so it leads to a lot of ultrasounds. But another common way that the uh, blockage is found is on a screening ultrasound. So many patients will go to screenings that are given by lots of different organizations. We do these every so often, hmm. where patients will come in and have an ultrasound of their neck arteries just to see if there's blockage. Patients who have no symptoms, who've never had a stroke or a mini stroke, and we can talk about that a little bit, oftentimes are treated only with medicine and not with surgery or any other procedure. Sure. So, it, so suppose I, I, I um, go to my doctor for a routine physical, he or she hears a brewery, then sends me for an ultrasound, and uh, I do have atherosclerotic disease involving my carotid artery. Um, what, what is the risk of me just saying, you know, I'm just going to Alaska and I'm gonna enjoy things? What's the risk to me, and, and, and if I'm asymptomatic and have no, no, uh, no symptoms at all, um, what would normally be done? So the risk for patients that are asymptomatic depends on how bad the blockage is. People who have a blockage of more than 75% in their carotid artery have a five-year risk of stroke of 11% if they're completely asymptomatic. Patients with blockage less than that have a much lower risk, and patients with blockage less than 50% have the same risk of stroke as anybody else walking around out there every day. So a majority of patients end up being treated with medicine rather than with surgery. People who are at really good surgical risk, if they have a severe blockage in their carotid artery, we often recommend surgery to clean that out to prevent a stroke. Yeah, and what do you, what do, you do when you, um, when you operate on the carotid artery? How, where do you make your incision and, and what do you actually do to, to clean out the inside of that blood vessel? So the, the operation is called carotid endarterectomy, and what that means is surgical removal of the plaque from the inside of the carotid artery. That involves an incision that goes along the front of the neck, right along the muscle. And when somebody's asleep under anesthesia, usually, sure. we move all the nerves off the artery, get the artery exposed. We expose the artery above the blockage and below the blockage. We don't mess with the blockage until we have everything exposed above and below it. We give some blood thinners in the operating room, then we clamp the artery above and below the blockage open the artery, scoop all the stuff out of it, all the plaque and the nasty stuff that's within the artery. Usually we'll then put in a shunt to carry blood flow to the brain while we work, and then after the artery is completely cleaned out, sew a patch on the artery to make it bigger. And what do you use uh, for that patch? Uh, usually we use a material called bovine pericardium, which is a sac from around a cow heart, and that's uh, removed, it's gamma sterilized, it's a wonderful material, resistant to infection, not a whole lot of bleeding when you use that. It's a very good material, very commonly used. Sure, and why is it important to see a vascular surgeon? Obviously, there's, there's recently been a huge amount of uh, lay press on volume outcome relationships. And, and of course, I think um, probably three or four decades ago, a few cancer centers um, really became famous by saying all we do is cancer and therefore patients should really come to the cancer center. We obviously have a big cancer center here that where, where I work. The same thing with our vascular program. We're trying to, if you will, treat medicine and surgery similar to um, similar to athletics, that the, the more foul, shoots, foul shots you practice, right. probably the better you become at it. But maybe your perspective on, on vascular surgeons, especially with, real, with respect to carotid disease, since um, uh, I think my concern over, over circulation to the brain is probably exactly what uh, is the concern of people listening to this video, right? Mm -hmm. it's a, it potentially is a dangerous operation. Yeah, carotid artery surgery is one of the very few truly elective operations that we do for asymptomatic patients that's being done purely preventatively to prevent a stroke. And repetition is the key to this. You have to do it a lot. You have to do it the same way every time to make it as safe as possible. It's the same as being an airline pilot. It's done the same way every time, following the checklist from top to bottom, make sure that it goes the same way so that your outcome is the best. And vascular surgeons perform the majority of these operations in the United States of America, people who are board certified and have done all this training to do it. There are a lot of non-vascular specialists who do these things in low volume, but 
but carotid surgery, particularly in the area of vascular surgery, is one of the areas where we've really found that volume of procedures is related to outcome. Sure. And it's been shown actually in several hospitals in other states that hospitals that have very low volumes of carotid endarterectomy have stroke rates that are 10 times higher than the national average. So doing these operations with a board-certified vascular surgeon in a high-volume center is extremely important for the best outcome. Obviously, the worst complication of the operation could be a stroke because of uh, either blood flow or a little plaque or something getting loose and going up into the brain, correct? Yes, and stroke is definitely the worst outcome. People can have heart attacks and various other things occur, but all of those things pale in comparison to stroke. Stroke is probably the worst possible outcome we could have. And for if, there probably is no routine carotid endarterectomy, but for, if you will, the average patient who you see who needs this operation, what is the risk of stroke? So the risk of stroke that we tell people is about between 1 and 1.5%. That's what's published in all the literature out there. Our risk of stroke in our group, and particularly my risk of stroke individually, is much lower than that. Yeah, that's great. Well, Pete, thank you very much, and I'd encourage all of you, if you would like more information on carotid endarterectomy, on vascular surgery in general, please view uh, our website from the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and there'll be additional information at the end of this video. Uh, Dr. Rossi, thanks again. Thanks, Dr. Evans.